Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, today I'm thrilled to have an exceptional guest joining us. His name is David A. Steinberg, co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Zeta Global. And my only apology is that we've waited this long to get him back on the podcast. Believe it or not, I last spoke with David uh, seven years ago on episode 59. We've had 2,400 interviews since. We hit it off. So I'm not sure what's happened and why we've not spoken to him in seven years. But it's an absolute delight and something I'm excited about today. Because with a successful track record of scaling businesses in the tech industry and a strong emphasis on innovation... David is now a leading figure in the world of AI and data-driven marketing. And recently, Zeta Global released an insightful analysis exploring the distinct shopping preferences across multiple generations, offering a a peek into the future of retail. And they're also one of the major players in the AI arms race because they've recently launched a generative AI agent that acts as virtual data analysis. That, that can act as a virtual data and that can act as a virtual data analyst, offering a significant boost to marketers. So I want to find out more about this and how technology and how AI is something to be excited about rather than feared. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to New York, where I'm excited to be joining David once again. So a massive warm welcome back to the show. We last spoke seven years ago on episode 59 when the world was a very different place, but 2,004 interviews later, 2,400 interviews later, I expect we may have a few more listeners, some fresh listeners. So can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do, my friend? Well, first of all, it's great to be back, Neil, because, you know, and I try to listen to your stuff as often as I can. You do some great great stuff. Always keep it fun, which I, I enjoy because that's my personality. You know, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded seven companies, uh, sold four, taken two public and chairman of another. And uh, I became a founder and entrepreneur for very much the same reason most of us did. Nobody would hire me. Uh, so I came out of school and started in the wireless business. And then after four or five companies in that space, I started what is today Zeta Global which is one of the largest big data and artificial intelligence marketing companies in the world. We help very large enterprises to create, maintain, and monetize customers at a substantially lower cost than they can without our data and our software. And Zeta Global has got a pretty impressive track record. I'm curious. I mean, we've last spoke seven years ago, but what factors do you think contributed to the success? And what do you believe lies ahead for the company? Because the the world is moving at such a rapid pace, isn't it? Yeah, you know, we got, I mean, I'd say some of it is luck, some of it is hard work. but, But what generally separates companies that succeed from companies that do not is execution. And, you know, we have an incredible team at Zeta Global. We just met with my entire senior leadership group a couple of weeks ago, 64 of the most talented individuals I've ever worked with. And really that execution, I think, is what differentiated us from a lot of companies that didn't achieve what we've been able to achieve. But quite frankly, more than anything, you know, the ability to help very large enterprises lower their cost to create, maintain, and monetize customers has been, it's been a good time to be doing that, right? Where you've seen a lot of turbulence in the market. Some markets are up, some are down. But at the end of the day, when you're navigating through changing times, you're always looking to do more with less. And our platform was purpose-built. You know, we combine as many as 17 different separate point solutions into our Zeta marketing platform. And because our data and our artificial intelligence can help enterprises to figure out not only who's interested in their products, but who can afford them and who can qualify for them. You can remove everybody who's not in market, not going to be approved and can't afford your products before you start spending the money on marketing. Mm -hmm. So you're taking about 50% of the cost out before you enter the marketing journey. And, you know, it's been very, very efficient. And although I said a few moments ago, the world's changed in the last seven years, if we're honest with each other, the world changed a lot two to three years ago. And if we're even more honest, the world changed completely just 
last six months, really. I mean, Gen yeah, AI open, uh, you know, chat GPT, that, that arrived, I think it was November last year. And yeah, it's hard result, to believe it's just that uh, soon, right? Yeah, and, and how quickly people have embraced it. And kudos to you guys as well. I mean, you recently launched generative AI agents that act as an almost virtual data analyst. So can you tell me a bit more about how this tech works, what it means for your clients, particularly those in the Fortune 100, company, uh, Fortune 100 companies that I know you serve, right? Yes. So 35% of the fortune 100 use our platform. So it's, uh, which, which is easier to say than uh, 35 of them. But the reality is that uh, what we see with very large clients is they're apprehensive to use large language models. Right. And I think part of that today is where is their data going and, and who else is it benefiting? Right. So we lovingly call our generative AI small language models. Now, interestingly enough, we're injecting about a trillion marketing signals a day into our small language models. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 still pretty, pretty big. Uh, But what we found is, you know, when you build a platform like your Zeta or your Salesforce or your Adobe, you're building a platform that's almost a 747. Yeah. Right. And if you put the right pilot in the right seat, they know how to fly it and they can really do it. But most individuals, if you put them in that seat, they're going to have a tough time with the vast majority of the functions of a 747. So like everybody else, we try to build the top 20, top 30 to really make the navigation easy. We figured out very quickly that we could use our own generative AI platforms, which we've internally developed and we can literally create real world examples. So you can say to our bots, we call them Zoe, uh, you can say to Zoe, what are my most valuable audiences? And she'll tell you. You can say, what audiences should I target that I haven't thought of? Who are my clients most likely to churn off my platform How do I stop that? So a lot of it is simply taking what you would need a large number of data scientists embedded into our clients' ecosystems and really, really simplifying it. And I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, right? Because AI is very complex. It's supposed to be out there doing a lot of stuff. Now, we have a lot of algorithms that are doing incredibly complex stuff on the ingestion of those signals down to deterministic data as comprehended with the Zeta ID number. And then that's giving an intent-based score, which actually is the data that feeds into the answer of that question. But by making it simpler, what we're seeing is greater utilization. Our clients are utilizing the platform at a higher rate, and we've been able to onboard more clients faster because of the simplicity of that. And and sort of, I think that's where AI is really going to really going to go initially in the sort of how do you take mundane tasks and automate them, but at the same time, how do you take highly complex tasks and simplify the answers? So I think it's going to be a bit of a barbell effect. Yeah, and what stands out for me, if we go back seven years when we last spoke, I suspect the way that people used to get that information was the the marketing team responsible for that. They would have to raise a call with IT, and then they have to wait around until IT, the, the IT guy that's in the office that knows how that report works can get that information, send it back, and then there might be something wrong, a bit of back and forth. Whereas now, people can just ask that question and get that information instantly. It's phenomenal, isn't it? It, it's it's and listen. If you think of sort of the advent of technology, just to step back a bit, right? So, yeah. so, so the biggest probably technical. I mean, hard to say that anything's more important than fire or the wheel. I'm not going to go far back quite that far. But if you start with the Gutenberg printing press, and then you sort of go to the telephone, and then the internet, and you know the computer came in somewhere in there. I would argue the computer really was unlocked by the internet. But, yeah. you know, if you if you look at that, in almost all cases, those technologies were land-based and in many cases protested because they believed they were going to end employment as we knew it. In every case, those technologies created substantially more jobs than they mm-hmm. destroyed. In every case. And in this case, you're looking at how this technology coupled with Moore's law 
coupled with Bezos's law, coupled with the lowering of the cost of transport of data every moment of every day, has allowed all of these algorithms to really work, right? So if, if somebody tried to roll out an algorithm like this, and, and I'm sure people did 20, 30 years ago, you couldn't run the report. Like it would take days. Uh, now we can run these types of reports in milliseconds that to your exact point, seven years ago, you would have had to have an IT person write the report. Hundred percent with you, and you were talking about audiences a minute ago. And one of the things that put you guys back on my radar was when you recently released an analyst, uh, an analysis exploring the shopping preferences of different generations, from Gen Z to millennials and Gen X. So I've got to ask, what were some of the key fi- findings in that report, and how do these insights help brands target their marketing strategies uh, more effectively? So, you know, we, one of the interesting things about seeing as much as we see is, is we built a bunch of really interesting contextual reports and, and information that can be shared with our clients to make them better. The thing that surprised me the most of all, of it, and there was a bunch of things, is that when you look at Gen Z, we think of them as sort of the technological leaders, right? They're the youngest, they're the leaders. Oh, they're not, I mean, there's now Gen Alpha, but, but they're, they're still crawling around, I think. But <laughs> teasing. Uh, 47% of Gen Zers would rather shop in a store and buy in a store than online. That, for me, shocked me because I, I'm a millennial. And I sort of think I sneak into being a millennial at 53, but who knows? <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm still, I'm, no, actually, I'm sorry, I'm Gen X. I'm not a millennial. I'm wrong. I sneak into Gen X, I should say. But, you know, I don't think I've walked into a retail store in a very long time yeah. to buy anything, right? I'm, I'm all in on online. I expected the younger generation to go even further online. Now, the difference between Gen Z and baby boomers who are still vast majority in the store is Gen Z does a tremendous amount of internet research before they go into the store. So it's funny, it's almost sort of back to the future because I remember years ago, I was in the wireless business through four different companies. And one of them was a big leap into the online distribution of wireless products. And what we found was 87% of people were researching their wireless phone online, and then they were going in and purchasing it somewhere. Those numbers have probably changed radically over the 20 years. I haven't haven't looked at them in a very long time. But the Gen Z in-store numbers are emblematic of that, where 80 or 85% are researching online before 47% are going offline to buy. The other really interesting thing is millennials who have always been sort of out front and and very vocal make 90% of their purchasing decision based on whether they think a brand is authentic or not. So how does that translate to our clients? You know, I keep the marketing authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Don't try to be something you're not, but definitely make sure that you're looking at this and you're able to really connect. And and we also found that 35% of people stopped buying a product because they believed it to become inauthentic. 90% of Gen Xers also said they would spend 10% more on a product today that they believe was sustainable. Then five years ago, only 35% said they would spend even 10% more for a sustainable product. So they're looking for authenticity and they're looking for sustainability. You know, Gen Z, millennials, and Gen X, you know, sort of bifurcate and differentiate in the ways they buy. And by helping our clients, because the data that we have at Zeta is deterministic, we know that Zeta ID number 135789 is 32 years old. We know that they've just researched a product online we then know there's a 47% probability they're going to go to a store to buy it. We can help our clients get in front of that consumer that day and say, we're running a special at this store 2.2 miles from where you live. That's something that the Zeta marketing platform can do 
And this type of insight allows us to do a better job of making those recommendations. Wow. And just to join everything up there and bring to life everything that we're talking about, as more and more generations come chronically online, how do you at Zeta Global assist marketers in understanding these digital natives? And also, what role do you see Gen I playing in this too? Because again, it's something everyone's talking about. So uh, I didn't understand. Did you, did you say generative AI? Yeah, sorry. Gen, I just said Gen AI. I, oh, I, it, sorry. Know, I was trying to figure out if you said Gen I, and I was like, oh, I don't know that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or, you know, by the way, Gen I, a lot of people would say is Gen Z, right? I'm I, but no. Yeah. But, but, but uh, no. And, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, right. So I meant, I meant generative AI. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I misunderstood. I, I apologize. It's, you know, what, as, uh, as I think uh, Winston Churchill said, you know, the Americans and the British are two common groups separated by language. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure I messed that quote up. But uh, the, the reality is that when you look at where the market is going and what Zeta does is because we're able to look at today, 550 million plus people have opted in to be in our data cloud. 240 million plus Americans, which is 90% of the adult population. Yeah. We, we then protect our clients by masking them with the Zeta ID number. So we never share anybody's personally identifiable information ever. But because we're seeing what people are reading, what they're ingesting, what they're researching, what transactions they're doing, we're able to determine when somebody is in market for one of our clients' products, and we're able to determine the best places to target them, whether that's connect to television, messaging, social, mobile, display, online video, everything can tie to the Zeta ID number. Hmm. So we're able to target that individual pretty much anywhere, as long as the client is using our platform to do the activation, because there's no primer to unlock the Zeta ID number anywhere outside of the Zeta marketing platform. We've never shared our data with anybody at any time, and we've never sold our data to any third party at any time. So by keeping it all inside of our own cloud, it, it's actually, it makes us pretty sticky. I think it's one of the reasons that we have a net retention rate as a company of about 113 to 115%, uh, where once you're using the platform, the algorithms continue to get smarter and smarter as we get the feedback loop. So this person purchased, what was their journey? Who else in the data cloud is taking that same journey right now? And would they be credit approved for your product or can they afford your product? Do they have a negative connotation towards your product? All of those different things play into do we target somebody using our software and our data? As you look at generative AI and sort of the evolution of that, you know, we've been working and patenting technology around natural language processing for, you know, quite frankly, almost 10 years. We have a patent portfolio, uh, one of the largest for a company our size, around machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence. And, you know, it's just as technology better supports it, it's getting smarter. Now, interestingly enough, I think generative AI is gonna have more of an impact on the sort of content generation, creative and other side. What we're doing is still really deep, deep, deep natural language processing. But what we've done is we've incorporated generative AI into making our products more accessible and more usable for our enterprise clients while we're working internally to make our people more productive using it, right? So it's it's an incredible tool uh, where our goal, and it's a bit grandiose, is how do we more than double the size of our company again over the next three years with the same approximate headcount? Uh, and you know we're not looking at it as to reduce headcount, but we're looking at it as a tool to make our existing people substantially more productive while simultaneously, as you're unlocking the power of generative AI, it's making the Zeta marketing platform easier for our clients to use. And, you know, quite frankly, all artificial intelligence is making our platform better. One of the reasons I think uh, we've been named the number one marketing automation platform in the world by multiple uh, 
uh, research groups, I believe is because when we completely re-architected the Zeta marketing platform, which we made the decision to do about five years ago and moved into it, the two big decisions we made that were different from all of our competitors were we made artificial intelligence and data native to the application layer. All of our competitors are now working on AI and many have been working on it for quite some time. None of them really own their own data sets. They're using the client's data set only. We're combining our data set with the client's data set, which is very, very additive. But we're also, because everything's native, things can be done in a millisecond or less. Imagine you're a, a marketing automation stack and you have to step out to your algorithm to ask a question and come back. And then you have to do a data query and then come back. Now that can be done quickly by most standards, but it can never be done as fast as when it's sitting native to the application layer. And that's one of the things I find so exciting about the, this advance in technology, because a lot of companies fall into the trap of reducing headcount, but I think they're completely missing the point because you can work so much quicker. You can scale so much quicker. And I think technology working alongside people, complementing people rather than competing with them, that's where the magic happens. But we all pick up our phones and scroll through those concerns about AI replacing human jobs. And as you said, AI will support our creative employees, not replace them. And I'm curious, from, from yourself in your current role, can you share how your company has balanced that AI implementation with job creation? Because I think that's something we need to talk more about. Yeah, listen, I, I mean, I, 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 I always joke, right? So you'll say, I'll, I'll say, this person is a hammer, but you can't build a house without a hammer. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's and, and I'm not referring to individuals as hammers. It's, it's, it might be a it's just a term I'll use to show how important somebody is mm. if another executive in my company is not understanding why that person's important, right? So what, what we're looking at is I see AI as an incredible tool. Let, let me give you a great example. The, I was recently over in France uh, at uh, Viva Tech with uh, Maurice Levy and, and, and the whole crew over there. And at one of the dinners, they had the, I forget the, uh, his exact title, but he was the government official in charge of artificial intelligence for Dubai. He was not the ambassador of AI, but he was like, he was a, like a cabinet level post. So, you know, the secretary of AI. And he'd been in place for five years. Think about how advanced yeah. that is. And he told this incredible story about how when the Gutenberg printing press came out, seven or eight countries in the Middle East outlawed it. They made it totally illegal for 182 years. In that period of time, the Middle Eastern countries that, that protested it were the largest global economy at that time. 182 years later, Europe, had doubled their economy because they protested that technology. Yeah. AI is going to be a very similar thing. AI is going to drive economies. It's going to drive individuals. The, the other thing people don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is the aging of our global population and the lowering of our global birth rate, right? And you look at countries like Japan, now, China's even running into a, a challenge around population, and, and, and even in America, we're seeing a slower growth. Now, countries that are allowing more immigration, because you've got areas like sub-Saharan Africa, where the birth rate is very, very high, and, and, and they're growing from a population perspective. But when you look at this and you think about it, who's going to take a lot of these jobs 20 or 30 years from now when the baby boomers retire and the Gen Xers start to retire, right? I think automation is going to be mission critical to filling jobs that otherwise humans just can't fill. And I think at the same time, if we look at our internal group to answer your first question and say, right, we have, you know, 1700 approximate employees. We're not, a, you know, we're not, uh, we're not uh, IBM uh, in scale or size yet. But when you look at our global employees, 
I want our people to be able to do the jobs of two people each. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you need a really good hammer back to my original analogy. And quite frankly, I think generative AI is going to be one of the greatest hammers ever created to help individuals be substantially more productive. Now, individuals who learn about it and embrace it are going to do better than individuals who turn their back on it, much like the Middle East and Europe turning its back or embracing the Gutenberg printing press. Wow, what a powerful, powerful comment there. And I, I love that. And if we get further explore that and the potential for AI to increase the workplace productivity by eliminating repetitive tasks and all these things we're reading about, how do you see that impacting the roles and responsibilities within the workforce? Is, is there anything you could share around that? Yeah, no, but I think I think a lot of what I just said, right? Yeah. I think people who embrace it and say, okay, sorry. My next Zoom is popping up that I'm getting it on, and I apologize. Uh, to start again, because you'll probably want to cut that part. But yeah. the, yeah, you know, when we look internally, Neil, and we look at our people, I think people that embrace it and say, these are the tasks I'm doing that are mundane, and they identify as an employee, because we don't know every mundane task all of our people are doing. And they say, hey, we're going to use AI ourselves to do this. So I can be more strategic, even in a mid-level position. I think those are going to be the most successful people. I, I, I'll finish on the fact I did an interview the other day with one of the largest publications in the United States, a household name. And the reporter who was interviewing me, we were talking about AI. And I talked to a lot of reporters who were very nervous about it. This was a younger reporter, really cool guy. And he was like, are you kidding? I write half my articles with AI today. He yeah. said, I go in, I use it, I pull it out. Now he's like, I edit the heck out of it. I add my interviews, but I'm able to interview you twice as long if you're generous with your time, because I don't have to be writing the mundane paragraphs. Yeah. And I was like, this is a guy who's going to win. He's like, because he's like, he's like, to me, the more time I can spend interviewing people, the better I can be at my job and doing this other stuff, it just takes it off my plate. Absolutely love it. Inspiring stuff. And if we do look on the ongoing AI arms race, before I let you go, you've mentioned before I've been reading about you online that it's only as good as the data it ingests. And we've all seen in the past what happens with garbage in, you get garbage out. So can you elaborate on that statement and how what you're doing at Zeta Global ensures quality data ingestion for better AI outcomes? Because I think that's the exciting place. Yeah, and I think that's a big difference using a small language model versus a large mm -hmm. language model. And, and, and I think that's part of it, right? And most people don't realize that OpenAI has not ingested a stitch of data in quite some time. They sort of screenshot the internet, I believe, in, you know, sometime in 2022. So it's not feeding real-time data in. And what's happening is, it's starting to get even a little tired. Now they're going to change that. And they're going to they'll they'll fix that and figure it out. They're brilliant guys and 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 doing incredible work. And you look at what Google's doing with Bard and 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 how they're ingesting real time data every moment of every day. I, I think that when you look at what's there, it doesn't necessarily get you to an enterprise based outcome. Right? It's a very cool tool. And it's really interesting. It's particularly powerful on natural language, right? It's able to write a great poem or a great story. It, it's not yet sort of shown that it's able to change marketing or business intelligence or data management or any of those things. And by the way, at some point it will, but it's not there yet. Uh, so for us, what we're doing is we take our clients' first-party data, we take our first-party data, we merge it in what's called a consumer data platform or a CDP, and we're then using algorithms to look for patterns that no human could see by ingesting trillion of trillions of data points on top of it. What you find is the most relevant patterns are the ones that come to the top, and you could go out the yield curve to you know, call it 1,700 data attributes. That's not going to be very productive, right? But if most marketing platforms are looking at three or four 
We're looking at 20 or 30, which allows you to be substantially more targeted, but still deliver at major scale to our large enterprise clients. The ability to control that data with the AI allows you to have a much higher data input. And as I've said many times, the data outputs are only as good as the data you're in. And I think that's a powerful moment to end on. But before I let you go, for anyone listening, just wanting to find out more information about Zeta Global, explore some of the things that you're working on, contact your team. What, where would you like to point everyone listening? ZetaGlobal.com. You know, let's uh, let's stick with the uh, the uh, the website. But uh, it's been uh, it's been great. I really enjoy. And and by the way, we're we've announced our Zeta Live conference, which is our biggest deal of the year. That's going to be on September 28th. We'll be opening that up to anybody online in the next few weeks to be able to monitor that and see the speakers. I can't announce the speakers yet. We're doing our earnings call. Uh, it, it, well, you might, let me let me say that again, because this will come out after our earnings call. Yeah. Uh, I can't say who the speakers are today, but we're going to announce them very soon. Whoa, exciting. You've left us with a teaser. We'll have to get you on a little closer. But so much has changed in the last seven years. And I love how now we're talking about how, how AI can increase productivity in the workplace, eliminate, eliminate those repetitive tasks, and how AI can automate and things that can't be achieved by humans and how AI has the potential to create new jobs and augment existing ones. Because we've all seen what the uh, we've seen in the media here, and it's great to hear a different side of that tale. We're not going to leave it seven years until we speak again, my friend. I'd love to get you on towards the end of this year, find out more about that. And uh, more than anything, just thanks for rejoining me. I love chatting with you. I always love chatting with you too, Neil, and uh, reach out to us whenever uh, whenever you have time. And that wraps up another enlightening ep- and that run and that wraps up another episode of Tech Talks Daily. A big thank you to David A. Steinberg for, as always, providing such valuable insights into the evolving world of AI and its impacts on marketing, the workforce, and beyond. And for me, his visionary leadership at Zeta Global is truly shaping the future because by offering unique solutions and insights to businesses and marketers alike. Combined with the fact that we all know generative AI agents, combined with generative AI agents and high quality data becoming the keys to unlocking full potential of AI, I think it's incredibly exciting what they're doing at Zeta Global. It certainly appears to be at the forefront of this exciting tech development. So I encourage you all, please follow their journey as they continue to innovate in this tech world. I'm going to make yourselves and david a big promise and that's we're not going to leave it seven years till we speak to him again but uh i'd love to hear your thoughts on everything we talked about today from addressing concerns around ai and job security offering reassurances are you are you reassured after today's conversation how do you see ai enhancing productivity while still growing your global workforce and scaling your business We've heard about all the bad stuff, and I think it's time we restored the balance in the universe and talked about some of the good stuff, because David's comments there about the Gutenberg Press and the history of it certainly resonated with me. But as always, I'm the easiest guy in the world to find, techblogwriteroutlook.com, if you want to send me an email, if you want to get me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, uh, threads, wherever it is you hang out, just at Neil C. Hughes, nice and easy to find. So please send over your thoughts, your questions, anything you want to talk about, We'll keep this conversation going. But that's it for today. So just a big thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger.